This is one of the most advanced commercial jets in the world. It's the backbone of airlines from Amsterdam to Salt Lake City. It's built by the third largest aircraft manufacturer on the planet, a global titan of aerospace with a $20 billion order backlog and a reputation for genius engineering. And this is the exact same company. Bankrupt, paralyzed, a national joke left for dead on a factory floor. If you were to walk into Hangar 3 in July 1991, the first thing you would have noticed wasn't the sight, but the sound, or rather, the lack of it. It was a silence that had weight to it, thick with the smell of cold metal and abandoned dreams. This was Embraer, the nation's industrial crown jewel, and if you listen closely, you could almost hear it bleeding out. So you have to ask, how does a company go from this, a graveyard of broken dreams, back to this? A world conquering force in an industry dominated by superpowers. This isn't a story about a comeback, it's a story about an impossibility. And it starts not with a CEO or a politician, but with a quiet, stubborn man who walked back into the fire to settle a promise he had made to a ghost. Boru, Brazil, 1948, a small dusty town where the loudest sound was the train whistle and the biggest dream was just getting out. This was a place suspended between sleep and survival, far from the glamour of Rio or Sao Paulo. But beneath a wilting jacaranda tree, two boys had built an empire. The headquarters was a single park bench. They called it the office. Ozias Silva was a quiet observer. His best friend, Benedito Cesar, nicknamed Zico, was the fire. Together, they devoured grease stained aviation magazines. Every page was a reminder of a brutal truth. In the 20th century, the sky belonged to the superpowers. The planes that flew over their heads weren't just machines, they were symbols of American and European dominance. But Brazil? Brazil was just a customer, a place you landed, not a place you built. And for a boy like Zico, that wasn't just a fact, it was an insult. We gave the world Santos Dumont, Zico would mutter, his voice tight with frustration. And now we just watch? They didn't just watch, they studied. They built balsa wood models, they scavenged old radio parts. And when the townspeople laughed, saying, Avio e coisa de gringo, planes are for foreigners. They didn't argue, they went back to the bench and worked harder. At 17, they made a pact, not just to fly a plane, anyone could do that. Their vow was to build one, a Brazilian plane. And if the country wouldn't teach them how, they were forced to it. They enlisted in the Air Force, not out of pure patriotism, but as a strategy. It was the only place in Brazil that had the knowledge they carved. It was the only ladder out of Boru. That moment, two boys in crisp uniform boarding a military train should have been the start of a shared journey. Instead, it was the beginning of the end. Ozias became a pilot, flying rickety Catalina seaplanes into the heart of Amazon. It was a brutal classroom. The jungle wasn't just green, it was a wall of heat and noise. He delivered vaccines to villages that hadn't seen a doctor in months. He landed on rivers that had never known a runway. And with every treacherous flight, a realization hardened inside him. Brazil didn't need bigger, faster jets. It needed a workhorse. A plane that could land on dirt, be fixed with a wrench, and connect the forgotten corners of his country. When came the call that shattered his world, Zico was gone. A training accident, no survivors, just a diatone. That night, alone, in rain-soaked Trent in Belém, the dream felt dead. Zico had been the belief, the spark, the fire. Without him, what was left? Silence. Silva took a single page from his notebook. With slow, deliberate movements, he folded it. Corner to corner, crease by crease. A paper airplane. He held it in his hands a fragile symbol of an impossible promise. And in the roaring silence, he whispered a new vow, not to a god, but to his friend. You kept your side, he said to the empty tent. Now I'll keep mine. This wasn't just about ambition anymore. It was about redemption. He would build that plane, not for glory, not for profit, but for Zico.
By the late 1950s, Brazil was a country in a hurry, building a new capital, Brasilia, out of nothing. But it was still importing its technology, its machines, its future. One man, Brigadier Montegro Filho, was determined to change that. He had seen how America built its engineers at MIT. He returned to Brazil and founded ITA, an institute dedicated to aeronautics. It wasn't just a school, it was a mission. For Isaiah Silva, ITA was a runway he had been waiting for. He left the cockpit behind and became a student again, graduating first in his class. But a diploma wasn't his goal, the vow was. He moved directly into the government's technical center, the CTA, and there, in a drafty oil-stained hangar, he found them. A small band of brilliant, reckless engineers who shared his insane belief. They started designing a plane not for the world, but for Brazil, a twin turboprop that could land on dirt and be reconfigured in minutes. They called it the Banderite, the Pioneer. There was just one problem. Dreams have enemies, and theirs came in the form of a new boss, Brigadier Castro Neves, a man of spreadsheets, not visions. He reviewed the plans and with a single stroke of his pen, terminated the project. We do not build fantasies here, he declared. For most, that would have been the end. But Ozias had learned from his days in the jungle. When you face a storm, you don't turn back. You find a different path through it. He waited. Two weeks later, he presented the brigadier with a routine stack of paperwork, fuel orders, maintenance logs, payroll authorizations, dozen of pages of bureaucratic burden and slipped quietly in the middle was a page unsigned sheet reauthorization for development of turbo pop demonstrator the brigadier distracted and tired signed it without a second glance it was a bureaucratic defiance the plane was alive again what followed was a miracle on borrowed time they worked in secret like insurgents the scavenged parts from retired aircraft they welded by flashlight. When a young engineer collapsed from exhaustion, Silva gathered a team. You see aluminium, he told them, pointing to the half-finished plane. I see my friend Zico. I see a country that gets laughed at it when it says the word aviation. We will finish this. They needed a miracle. And in August 1968, history decided to deliver one in the form of a fog. A thick fog blanketed Sao Paulo grounding all flights. The chaos rerouted the presidential jet to one runway still open, San Jose de Campos, and Isaiah Silva was waiting. When the president of Brazil, Arthur de Costa e Silva, stepped off his plane into the misty morning, he wasn't met with a military parade. He was met by a lone engineer in coveralls. Mr. President, Ozias said, his voice steady, I have something to show you. It might change everything. He led the president not to a boardroom, but to the hangar. And there it stood, the banderante, unpainted, unfinished, but undeniably real. Ozias didn't sell the plane. He sold the nation back to itself. He spoke of jungles and isolation, of doctors who couldn't reach patients, of a Brazil stitched together by rivers and silence. This aircraft, he said, his hands on his cold metal skin, is a lifeline. The president walked around the plane, a quiet understanding dawning on his face. He turned to Ozias. This is what we need. Three weeks later, a presidential decree was signed. A new company was born, Impresa Brasilia de Aeronautica, Embraer. And Ozai Silva, the rogue engineer, was named its first president. What followed was a controlled explosion. The Bandreira flew, orders came in, Embraer expanded, building agricultural planes and military trainers. It became a symbol of national pride. But by the 1980s, the dream began to soar. State ownership meant bloat and bureaucracy. Brazil's economy collapsed into a nightmare of hyperinflation, with pricing soaring over 2,000% a year, and Embraer, tied to the government, was sinking with it. Its ambition outpaced its reality, culminating in the CBA 123 vector. It was a beautiful machine, but it was also a commercial disaster that sunk over $300 million into its development, money that could have been used to build schools or hospitals, all for a plane that not has a single major airline wanted to buy. It was a perfect symbol of Embraer's sickness. Building for prestige, not for purpose. 
By 1990, Embraer was hemorrhaging money, production lines stalled, the dream was dying, and that's when they called him back. When Ozias returned in 1991, the press asked if he had come to bury the company. He walked past them into building where the lights had been turned off to save money and whispered to himself, "We're not dead yet. You have to understand, what he did next wasn't resurrection. This was surgery, and it was going to be brutal. He had to privatize Embraer, cut it free from the state that was suffocating it." He laid off engineers he had trained. He faced down unions and politicians. To the workers, he was a traitor, an undertaker cutting the dream. But Ozias heard a different voice in his head, Zico's. This wasn't about destroying a dream. It was giving it freedom to fly. He knew a hard truth. Dreams rot in cages. They need risk. They need accountability. By 1994, the surgery was complete. Embraer was a private company. It was wounded, lean, but for the first time, it was free. And Ozaya saw an opportunity when no one else did. In the 1990s, the titans of aerospace, Boeing and Airbus, were in a heavyweight battle fight, throwing 747s and A380s at each other. They didn't just ignore the regional jet market; they held it in contempt. An unnamed Boeing executive at the time was rumored to have said, "Let the little guys fight over breadcrumbs." They had no idea that a small company from Brazil was about to use those breadcrumbs to build an empire that would challenge their own. On a whiteboard. Ozias Silva sketched the concept for the ERJ-145, a 50-seat regional jet. It wasn't just a plane; it was an insurgency, a strategy to go where they won't. When the ERJ-145 debuted in 1995, the industry was stunned. It was fast, efficient, and cheap to operate. American Eagle placed a landmark order for 42 jets, a deal worth nearly one billion dollars. Suddenly. Embraer wasn't just a Brazilian curiosity; it was a global player. By 2001, less than a decade after being left for dead, Embraer had captured 35% of the regional jet market. They had been ambushed by a company that never even saw them as a threat. But Silva and his successors didn't stop. They launched the E-Jet family, a range of aircraft that offered mainline comfort with regional economics, no middle seats. Just quiet, efficient performance. It became the default choice for airlines looking to connect the in-between cities. Embraer had ambushed the giants by fighting them on their own terms. Today, that legacy of smart insurgency continues. When Airbus acquired a competitor, Embraer responded with the E2 series, next-generation jets so efficient they reset the industry standard. They expanded into defense, building the C390 Millennium, a transport jet now being adopted by NATO countries. They conquered the light business jet market with the Phenom 300, the best-selling jet in its class for over a decade straight. And now they're pioneering the future with Eve Air Mobility, the electric flying taxi division. It's 2025. In that small park in Baru, a young girl launches a paper airplane into the afternoon sun. It wobbles, catches a breeze. And soars overhead. A real jet descends towards a nearby airport. It's an Embraer E195 E2, a Brazilian jet built by a Brazilian company, flying a route that once would have taken days by land. On a nearby bench, an old man watches. Ozias Silva. His hands are weathered. His posture is stooped, but his eyes still follow the plane with a familiar fire. The bench is chipped and faded, but it's still there. Just like the dream, he never wanted a statue. He wanted a runway anyone could land on, and he built one. The result is a global empire. Today, Embraer stands as the third largest commercial aircraft manufacturer on Earth. A company valued at over nine billion dollars, with a twenty billion dollar backlog of orders. Its jets dominate the skies in over eighty countries. Its defense division supplies NATO allies, and its business jet. Has been the undisputed leader in its class for more than a decade. It started with a vow between two boys on a dusty park bench—a vow that proved one timeless truth. 
The sky doesn't belong to empires. It belongs to those who believe they belong in it.